Therefore, welcome to this new unit, Rotational Kinematics. Today, basically, we will look at the constant angular velocity, sorry, the constant angular acceleration particle model. Now, this model describes an object that rotates or spins with a constant angular velocity. Um, but before we go ahead to treat this object, remember that in physics, the word systems basically imply an object of interest. Now, the motion of a system depends on two factors. One, the point of application of the force. Two, the mass distribution of the system. These two factors basically determines how a system moves. Basically determines how a system moves. Now, a system can be a point particle system at which the mass is concentrated at a single point, or it could be an extended body system in which the mass is distributed throughout the system. Now, a point particle system can only undergo translation Translation is a word used to describe motion in a straight line. In other words, the application of a force for a point particle system will produce only translation, and the motion of such a particle is governed by the equation F equal to what? Ma. This means that F net is equal to the mass of the system times its acceleration, which is equal to mv t, which can still be represented as the change in momentum over the change in time. Therefore, the effect of a net external force on a point particle system is what? The change in the momentum of the system. is equal to the change in the momentum of the system. <clears throat> this right here is what we call the impulse momentum theorem. It's what we call the impulse momentum theorem. But what happens if the system is an extended body system. If the system is an extended body system, an extended body system can either be rigid or fluid. A fluid is anything that can flow. A fluid is anything that can flow. A rigid body is an object that has a constant shape 
under size. It's an object that has a constant shape and size. In other words, it is an object that does not deform as it moves. But then, for rigid objects, for rigid objects, the motion depends on the point of application of the force. The motion depends on the point of application of what? The force. Let me show you an example. Let's say you have a box, a tall box, lying on a surface. This is the center of mass of the box. If we apply a force at this point, this is F1, and a force at this point, this is F2, you will notice that F2, the line of action of F2, passes through the center of mass. The line of action of F2 passes through the center of mass, but the line of action of F1 doesn't pass through the center of mass. So what happens? F2 will produce translation, while F1 will produce rotation. You discover that F1 will cause the box to do a topple over like this. The box will topple over, but X1, F, sorry, F1 will cause the box to topple over, and F2 will cause the box to do a, to move forward. You get it right? So how this box behaves depends upon the point of application of what? This force. You understand that, right? Depends upon the point of application of this force. So I'm, I'm saying that it is possible for this box to undergo rotation and translation at the same time depending upon what? The point of application of what? The force on the object. Do you get me? So write it down. It is possible for a system to undergo rotation and translation simultaneously. It is possible for a system to undergo rotation and translation simultaneously. But write this down, please. The translation of the center of Mars is independent of the rotation about the center of mass. The translation of the center of mass is independent of the rotation about the center of mass. Now, to describe the rotation of an object, what must we first specify? Akish, can you go to the door, please? and perform a simple experiment for us. Just open the door gently, close the door. Now, when a kitch exerts a force on the door, what happens? It rotates about the hinge. You understand that, right? So the hinge is our axis of rotation or the pivot. Do you understand that? So for us to describe the rotational motion of an object, we must first specify what? The axis of rotation or the pivot. Write that down, everybody. Thank you, please. All right. Look up, everybody. If we have a door, this is our hinge. So this is this here represents our pivot. 
if we apply a force on that door F what happens the door will rotate either in this direction or in that direction so this angle here let's call this angle delta theta we are not interested in that angle yet but this is the line of action of this force the distance from this distance from here to that point l is called the lever arm that is the lever arm so the lever arm is equal to what the perpendicular distance from the line of action of the force to the pivot from the line of action of the force to the pivot the tendency of a force to produce rotation is called torque the tendency of a force to produce rotation is called torque so torque tau is going to be equal to what f multiplied by the lever m f multiplied by the lever m yes please how? Uh, it's, like it's a decorated T. Pi is like that, but tau okay, is so like that. that mm -hmm. In a more general case, if we have, for example, an object like this, let's say this is our axis of rotation, which is also known as the pivot. Now, if we have a force acting at this point in this direction, like that, this is our force F, what will be the... Now, this object, because of this force, will evidently rotate in that direction. But the question is, where is our lever M? Is it this distance from here to here? which is L, or is it this distance from here to here? Let me call it X. Is it L or X? Which one is the lever M? Let me draw, try to draw a straight line. So, which one is the lever M? Is it X or L? This angle, let's call it theta. Our lever arm will be, Dylan, what do you think? What is the definition of a lever arm? Which distance is perpendicular? This angle here is 90 degrees. This is theta, so X is the lever arm. Which line is perpendicular from the line of action of the force to the pivot? Is it this line or this line? It's this line, right? But most students will always choose this line, which is faulty. You get it, right? This is a trick, and you may fall, fall for it in the exam. So the torque will be equal to F multiplied by X. But if you look at the simple trigonometry, X sine theta is X over L which means that x is equal to L sine theta. Therefore, torque will be equal to FL, the sine of theta. And that is the general definition of what? Torque. So, to, 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 to make this very clear, forces give rise to torque and torque give rise to what? Rotation. So forces produces torque which in turn does what?
produces rotation. Do you understand that? So by definition, torque is equal to FL sine theta. Write this, everybody. Torque is to rotation as force is to translation. Torque is to rotation as force is to translation. In other words, wherever you see force for translation, you should replace it by what? Torque. Yes, please. Good. The SI unit for torque is the same as what? Newton meter. Because torque is defined as force multiplied by what? Length sine theta. The unit for force is the Newton. The unit for L is the meter. This guy here is unitless. So the unit for torque is Newton meter. Which other physical quantity that you've heard before has the unit Newton meter? Yep. Newton meter is equivalent to joules, but this is not equivalent in this case. So it's possible for two systems or two physical quantities to have the same word units, even though they are not equal. You understand that, right? It's possible for two objects to have the same units, even though they are not what? Equal. But the condition for two objects to be what? For two physical quantities to be the same is for them to have what? The same unit. Um, look up, everybody. If we have a turntable or a disk, let's say it's rotating about an axis through its center. This is our reference line. If we have an object initially at this point, and this disk rotates counterclockwise, let's say to this point, and the radius here is R, it subtains an angle at the center delta theta. This distance, we call this distance the arc length delta S. The center of the circle is O. This is point P. Delta theta, the change in the angular position is known as what? Angular displacement. You've seen this before. We know that delta theta is positive for counterclockwise rotation. And delta theta is negative for clockwise rotation. Now, theta is measured in radians. And we know that when an object goes around a circle once, that is one revolution, it's equal to what? Two pi radians. Keep in mind that theta can also be measured in terms of what? Revolutions. And one revolution is equivalent to two pi radians, which is equivalent to 360 what? degrees. The next term is average angular velocity, omega, which is defined as the change in the angular watt position divided by the change in time. This means that the SI unit of omega is radians per watt seconds. Now, omega can still be measured in revolutions per seconds, which is equivalent to 2 pi radians per watt seconds. So to convert from revolutions to radians per seconds, all you have to do is multiply by 2 pi. 
Similarly, if you look at this formula that it's in a box, you will discover that omega does not depend on the radius or lever m. That means that omega is the same everywhere. That implies that omega is the same everywhere on a rotating object. Yes, please. Remember that, recall that one revolution is equal to two pi radians, right? If you divide both sides by seconds, then you get that relationship. You see that, right? So to transform from revolutions to radians, multiply your answer by 2 pi. This means that 2 revolutions per second is equivalent to 4 pi radians per what? seconds. All I've done, I've multiplied it by 2 pi. Okay, good. Now, the next question is, omega is a vector whose direction is determined, if you remember, by the right-hand rule. Whose direction is determined by the right-hand rule? Yep. So if you have an object that is rotating counterclockwise, like this, put your hand let your fingers curl in the direction of what? Rotation. Your thumb will point in the direction of what? Omega. So in this case, omega is out of the board. On the other hand, if an object is rotating clockwise, and we do this, omega will be pointing into the page or into the board. So omega is into the page. I'm going to represent this by an, an x. Here I'm representing it by a dot. So in case A, omega is pointing out of the page. And in case B, omega is pointing into the page. If you recall... Omega is equal to 2 pi over t, which is 2 pi f, where t is the period, and f stands for what? The frequency. We know that the arc length delta s is equal to r delta theta. This implies that delta s over delta t is equal to r delta theta over delta t, which means that v is equal to r omega. This is a review. So the conclusion we can draw is that the tangential speed or linear speed is proportional to the radius. Is proportional to the radius. So an object, if you have two objects, this is a rim, and if this is a tire, these are the spokes, an object here, A, and an object here, B, the velocity of B will be greater than the velocity of what? A. But the angular velocity at B will be equal to the angular velocity at what? A. Because here, V is equal to R omega. But here, omega is just the change in theta over the change in T, which does not depend on what? R. So omega is the same everywhere, but the linear and tangential what? Speed increases with increase in what? Radius. Now the next, angular acceleration 
alpha is equal to delta omega all divided by delta t. This implies that the SI unit of alpha is radian per second squared is radian per second squared. Another way to look at this would be the fact that we know that one revolution is equivalent to two pi radians, which means that one revolution per second is equivalent to two pi radians per second, which means that one revolution per second squared is equivalent to two pi radians per what? Second squared. Any questions? Let's look at the equations of motion. Specifically, we will look at the constant angular acceleration. So um, we know that alpha is equal to omega f minus omega i divided by tf minus ti which is just omega f minus omega i divided by t. This means that omega f minus omega i is equal to alpha t, and therefore omega f will be equal to omega i plus alpha t. This is the first equation of motion. Does this resemble anything to you? So you have v... F is equal to VI plus AT. Now, that means if we draw a graph of omega against T, it will be a straight line graph like that. This is omega I. The area under this graph, what does it represent? Angular displacement, good. That implies that delta theta, this, uh, this shape here, what is this shape called? A trapezoid. And the area of a trapezoid is half the sum of what? Parallel sides multiplied by the base. Have you seen an equation like this before? Yeah. Delta x equal to one half vf plus vi multiplied by what t so far we have shown that omega f is equal to omega i plus alpha t and uh, delta theta equal to one half omega f plus omega i multiplied by t. What I'm going to do is take all of these and substitute in the place of omega f. When I do that, I will have half bracket omega i plus alpha t plus omega i multiplied by t and that will give us omega i t plus half alpha t squared this is delta theta in other words theta f is equal to theta i plus alpha t plus half alpha t squared that is not true plus omega i t have you seen an equation like this before you have x f equal to x i plus v i t plus half a t squared 
So, so far, we have 1 omega f equal to omega i plus alpha t 2 delta theta equal to 1 half omega f plus omega i multiplied by t and 3. If you look at this equation, you will see that t is going to be equal to omega f minus omega i all divided by alpha. If you substitute this t here, you will end up with delta theta equal to omega f plus omega i all divided by 2 omega f minus omega i all divided by alpha looking at these two brackets what do you recognize in there implicitly you know that a squared minus b squared is a plus b a minus b right so this would mean that this is equal to omega f squared minus omega i squared all divided by 2 alpha and if you simplify you have omega f the fourth equation will be equal to omega f squared omega i squared plus 2 alpha delta theta so if we want to compare this this is linear motion this column is rotational motion one vf equal to vi plus at and that gives us omega f equal to omega i plus alpha t two Delta X equal to VF plus VI divided by 2 multiplied by T. You have Delta Theta equal to Omega F plus Omega I over 2 all multiplied by T. Excuse me, Lester, for a quick announcement. The HPC workout today, due to collaboration day schedule, will move up to 2.30 and 3.30. Once again, all athletes will work out in the HPC after school today. The workouts will not be at 2.50 and 4 o'clock today. They will be at 2.30 and 3.30. Thank you. This is theta F equal to theta I plus omega I T plus half alpha T squared. If you look at the two sets of equation, you see how similar the equation that governs translational motion and the equation that governs what? Rotational motion. So what can we conclude? You will see that to transpose from linear motion to rotational motion theta sorry x o y is represented by what theta v is represented by omega a is represented by alpha f is represented by tau and m is represented by capital I where capital I stands for the moment of inertia. So you don't need to memorize the equation for rotational motion. If you know this transposition then it will be easy. Take for example linear momentum P is equal to MV, angular momentum, 
J will be equal to what? What represents M? I. What represents V? Omega. M is mass. You get it right. Newton's second law, F is equal to MA. To transpose it to what? Rotational motion, the Newton's second law for rotational motion will be? Who can give it to me, please? F is transposed to? Tau. tau. M is transposed to? I. A is transposed to? Alpha. alpha. What about Ft equal to what? Change in MV. Which law is this? Impulse momentum, right? Now for rotation, that will become what? Tau multiplied by T equal to what? M omega. Or better still, equal to I change in omega. Just like that. How much time is left for the class? One. So we are done with rotational kinematics. The next class will begin with a 10 question quiz on these concepts that we've done today. Yeah, clicker quiz.